The name's Daredevil. Remember it. You'll be hearing it again. I promise. Quote the Daredevil. Daredevil, Volume 1, Issue 1. The origin of Daredevil. One night at Bogwell's gym, a number of the bruisers that work there are enjoying a game of cards when they're interrupted by the arrival of Daredevil who has come looking for their boss, the Fixer. The henchman of the Fixer remarked that the Daredevil must be some kind of nut they instruct Porky to throw the costume clown out. Porky responds saying it'll be a pleasure and he can use the exercise. Daredevil flips Porky over with his legs, stating that if exercise is what Porky wants, he has come to the right guy. Daredevil seizes Porky by his legs and performs an airplane spin, colliding with the other henchmen. The impact causes them to topple like bowling pins. Another henchman reaches for a shotgun, but Daredevil swiftly hurls his billy club at him. Daredevil remarks, sorry, playmate, you'll have to move faster than that. If you're reaching for a gun, I suppose a simple little billy club will Will do, he continues. No sense wasting expensive bullets on a nobody like me. Porky dives towards Daredevils, but the agile hero deftly jumps out of harm's way. Subsequently, another henchman hurls a chair at Daredevil, who skillfully moves out of its path, having sensed the attack from behind his back. The bruises surround Daredevil, but he swiftly jumps into the air and grabs onto the rings meant for pull-ups. With agile efficiency, he knocks them down again. In fact, if I don't know better, I begin to suspect that I'm not really welcome here. Okay, mister, we've had it. Now who are you and what do you want? It ain't possible. Nobody can fight like that. He must do it with Meras. Now that playtime's over, I'll hang around until I find the fixer. As for who I am, you can just call me Daredevil. Daredevil, a brand new name in the world of superheroes, but one which is destined to reach the very heights of glory, for Daredevil has a special type of power such as no adventure has ever had before. To learn what it is, Let's go back a few years, back to the origin of the man called Daredevil. Daredevil reflects back to his past and the events that led to his becoming this new costume hero. The year is 1950 and the prize fighter battling Murdoch converses with his eight-year-old son, Matthew. Young Matthew Murdoch expresses his reluctance, saying, But I don't want to study now, Dad. Why can't I go out and play with the kid? I can study later on. Jack Murdoch, the father, firmly responds, No, Matt, you will do it now. Now, you will study every chance you get. Jack Murdoch says, I promised your mother before she died that I wouldn't let you grow up to be an uneducated pug like me. You are going to amount to something, Matt. Matthew Murdoch responds, but I want to be like you, Dad. I'm proud of you, the greatest. Jack interrupts saying, don't say it, boy. I'm past my prime. I have no further nothing. I can do nothing but become a punching bag for younger men. Continuing the father's asserts, but I won't let that happen to you. You are going to study become a lawyer or a doctor, you will be somebody, the somebody that I can never be. As the years roll by, Matt Murdock does his best to live up to his father's dream. He becomes the top student in his class, forsaking all sports and athletic activities. Although his heart aches for the thrills of baseball and football, Matt Murdock thinks to himself, if only dad would let me try out for the team, I'd be as good as any of them. I just know I would, but I cannot go against his wishes. I cannot defy dad after all he has done for me. After all his sacrifices, I've got to be the son he wants me to be. And so the young Matt Murdock goes his lonely way, spending every minute he can spare with his books, never sharing the games of other teenagers. No one can be as cruel as unthinking youth. It's only a matter of time before the neighborhood kids made up the nickname for Matt, a name he will long remember. The kids nicknamed him Daredevil. Matt Murdock, after being teased, reaches his room and says, Someday I will show them. I will make them eat their words. I am as strong as any of them, as rugged as any of them, and I shall prove it. Someday I will prove it. With anger boiling within him and the resentment of youth, he strikes out at his dad's punching bag, and with the pent-up fury of a thunderclap, Matt thinks, the day will come when no one laughs at me again. It is only natural that the son of the battling Murdoch should take too vigorously to training the way a duck takes to water. And so in the months that follow, while his dad is out of 
talent on the boxing circuit, he trains very hard. But no matter how hard he trains, he's a determined teenager, never forgets the goals he has set for himself. Battling Murdoch says, Matt, I know I have tough I have been on you for a while while the other kids were out playing and having good times. But come when you'll thank me. You are going to amount to something just the way your mother wanted you to. But there is one problem with battling Murdoch keeps from his son. He can't land the fight and no manager will take him except the fixer who is very shady. In a fateful moment, Matt Murdoch intervenes heroically to save a man from a path of a speeding truck carrying a hazardous radioactive material. Although successful in rescuing the individual, the perilous encounter takes an unexpected turn as the truck's cargo spills and Matt finds himself unwillingly exposed to potent ra- radioactive substance. Later at Municipal Hospital, your son is a very brave lad, Mr. Murdoch. You must try to be equally as brave in the days of head. If, if only I had happened to be me instead of him. If only I had been there. Don't, Dad. It could be worse. Even if I do lose my sight, at least I'm alive. And days later after the injured boy returns home. Good news, Matt. The doctor report says that an operation may restore your sight in a few years after the tissues have healed. That's great, Dad. Until then, don't worry. I'm still keeping up my studies using books written in Braille. I'll get my diploma yet. You'll see. The aftermath of this incident brings about a profound transformation in Matt's sensory perception. Despite the loss of his sight, he discovers that the radiation has heightened his remaining four senses to superhuman levels. His sense of smell becomes incredibly acute, following him to detect scents with unparalleled precision. Taste becomes an exquisite palate, discerning nuances imperceptible to ordinary individuals. Touch involves in a heightened sensitivity, involving him to perceive the most subtle changes in his environment. His learning becomes extraordinary sharp, capturing sounds from great distances. But whatever the explanation is, it is extremely confidently self-assured Matt Murdock, who finally graduates from high school and is eagerly accepted by the Director of Admissions of State College, where we may find him sharing a dormitory room with his new buddy, Franklin Foggy Nelson. Matt, you old hound, how do you do it? I study like a demon, but you just breeze through the courses with all the top grades. I guess my dad deserves the credit, Foggy. He had me study so hard when I was younger that it all seems to come easy to me now, and I wouldn't be surprised if the radiation I absorbed in the accident doesn't have something to do with it, too. Everything seems easy for me now. All the senses are razor sharp. The fixer, a dubious figure in the world of boxing, orchestrates a deceitful scheme by fixing all of battling Murdoch's fights to ensure his victories. One fateful night, the fixer issues a command to Jack, instructing him to intentionally lose a match. However, fueled by pride and desire to be a role model for his son, Jack adamantly refuses to throw the fight and against the fixer's wishes, emerges victorious in the ring. As the crowd cheers for battling Murdoch's unexpected triumph, he reflects on the loyalty and the support of his son who was present that night to cheer for his father. Jack realized that he is instilled in his boy the values of hard work and given one's best effort. The thought of disappointing his son becomes inconceivable. Determined not to let his son down, Jack resolutely secures the victory with the announcement echoing through the arena. The winner, battling Murdoch. In a sinister turn of events, the fixer, angered by Jack's defiance, takes drastic measures, seeking to maintain control over the fixed matches and eliminate any potential threats to his schemes. The fixer orders an unthinkable act. In a tragic twist, Jack Murdoch pays the ultimate price for his refusal to throw the fight as the fixer has him killed. After his father's funeral, Matt graduates from law school and opens his own law firm with Foggy and they hire a secretary named Karen Page. I can't break that promise I made and yet with my agility, my extra sharp senses, there is so much I could do. I can't let all my powers go to waste. Wait, I have it. I'll see to it that Matt Murdock never does resort to force, but somebody else will. Somebody totally different from Matt Murdock. All I need are some old shirts which I can stitch together. I'm no Betty Ross, but I should be able to handle this. Luckily, my touch is so sensitive. I can even blend the colors for each colored fabric has to a different feel to me. A few hours later, there, whenever I don the costume, I'll no longer be Matt Murdock, but I'll need a new name. What if the kids in the old neighborhood could see me now? The kids who taunted me, called me Daredevil. What's that? Daredevil. They called me, but they meant it as an insult. Well, that's who I'll be. The name is perfect. The costume is tight enough to wear under my clothes if need be. I'll just make a few finishing touches on the headpiece when I'm through. Daredevil will be recognized anywhere. Even though I don't need it all, continue to carry a cane as Matt Murdock. That gives me another idea that cane would be a great weapon for Daredevil. Though the long night, the unseen man works his super sensitive fingers molding and manipulating his cane 
far more precisely than a normal craftsman might do. I'll hinge it in the middle design, a sheet for it. It'll be the perfect all-purpose weapon. It's perfect. I can use it in a hundred ways. And now for that job at hand, I've got to bring my father's murderer to justice. Tomorrow's Saturday, the office will be closed, so I'll start in the morning. And I know just where to begin. The fixer, in a confrontational tone, asks, Somebody asking for me? What do you want? Daredevil results an undeterred response. Correction, fixer. You are the one who's going to talk. The tension between them escalates as Daredevil demands answers, challenges the fixer's authority, and signals a pivotal moment in their encounter. Daredevil, exuding authority, demands, I want to know what arrangement you had with Battling Murdoch. The fixer, adopting a defensive stance, resorts. Battling Murdoch? What's that to you? It ain't healthy to mention him in here. Tensions escalate as the confrontation unfolds and the skirmish commences between Daredevil and the fixer's bruisers. Daredevil, attuned to the subtle sounds around him, discerns the breathing of a goon and swiftly throws a billy club before the thug can reach his pistol. With heightened senses, Daredevil defies, catches the billy club mid-air, showcasing his exceptional reflexes and strategic prowess in the midst of the confrontation. One man attempts to sneak up on Daredevil, but it proves futile, for you cannot seek up on a person with hearing so acute that footsteps resonate like loud noises. In a desperate move, the man tries to escape, pulling a gun in the process, but Daredevil, with his heightened sense and swift reflexes, prevents his getaway, ensuring the confrontation continues. Daredevil asserts, Now, let's all sail down for a nice talk, unless you like another session with me. The Fixer interjects. Quiet, I'll handle this. I'm still the boss. Whoever you are, you're in a mess of trouble. You're not getting away with coming here and roughing us up. We've got laws to protect innocent people. Call the cops. The tension in the room escalates as the fixer attempts to regain control of the situation, asserting his authority despite Daredevil's intervention. Daredevil, finally attuned to his surroundings, hears the sound of a hand picking up a receiver and reacts swiftly, hitting the hand with his billy club. Addressing the fixer, Daredevil asserts, I suspect you were responsible responsible for the death of battling Murdoch. Why don't you confess now and save us all a lot of trouble? The intensity of the moment hangs in the air and Daredevil confronts the Fixer, seeking the answers and justice for the death of battling Murdoch. The Fixer vehemently denies killing battling Murdoch, but Daredevil, with his extraordinary senses, employs another power, listening to the pulse ray to discern if he is lying. Daredevil's super sense of hearing acts like a built-in lie detector. As the truth becomes evident, the Fixer realizing the weight of the situation begs for his life in a desperate plea for mercy. One of the Fixer's henchmen, recognizing Daredevil's attention to the Fixer's heart rate, takes decisive action and forcefully pushes Daredevil out of the window in an abrupt and uncontrolled motion. Daredevil is sent hurling through the air, expelled from the room, and into the open space outside. A normal man with all his senses might be doomed in such a situation, but the moment the fearless Daredevil feels himself hurling into space, his super keen ears catch the rustling of a flag as his light fast reflexes go into action. A flagpole alongside me. Only one chance. Pressing the hidden stud which releases his cane handle at the same split second as he lunges out, he stops his fall in mid-air. Got it. From here on all, it's all a breeze. Now then, gents, where were we? He's back! While across the city, Foggy goes to find Matt to help him to work, but he doesn't find him either at home or at the office. When he asks Karen, she shows tender sympathy for Matt's condition. It would be hard to imagine Karen Page's feelings if she could see the handicapped man she's referring to at this moment. Out all of you, I'm only interested in Slade and the Fixer. Boy, you don't have to tell me twice. Come back, you rotten cowards. Don't leave us with him. Now you too, I've learned what I wanted. Slade actually did the shooting, but you gave the orders. What good will do you? You can't prove it. Yeah, where's your evidence? Daredevil strategizes, contemplating the final bluff to exploit their heightened anxiety, knowing they will believe anything. With confidence, Daredevil reveals, right here I have a miniature tape recorder concealed in my billy club. It'll tell the police everything. However, before Daredevil can make a move, the fixer attempts one last desperate maneuver, pulling the rug out from under Daredevil's leg. Seizing the opportunity, the fixer and his cohorts make their escape, leaving Daredevil momentarily thwarted in the pursuit of justice. My arm, I wrenched it. 
I was a fool for being so overconfident. I should have known they would have make one final try to escape. They can't have gotten far. I'll get them yet. But racing around the corner, Slade and the Fixer quickly mingle with the Saturday afternoon shopping crowd. He'll never find us now in the middle of this crowd. Just the same. Keep moving. There's no telling what that guy can do. I can still smell the traces of the Fixer cigar smoke. I can follow the scent like a bloodhound, but I'll be able to get around easier in the crowd without a costume. And so begins one of the strangest pursuits on record as a man without sight on Earling makes his way through a crowded avenue on the trail of two killers. I'm glad his cigar is a strong one. He might as well be telling me where he is, but he doesn't know. Switching back to Daredevil's disguise, Matt Murdock relentlessly pursues the fixer through the dimly lit labyrinth of the subway terminal. The catacomb of echoing footsteps and distant train rumbles fills the air as Daredevil devil closes in on his quarry. The fixer, driven to desperation, attempts to outpace the relentless vigilante, but Daredevil's heightened senses and acrobatic prowess prove insurmountable. As the chase reaches its climax, the fixer, burdened by the stress of the pursuit, succumbs to a severe heart attack. Daredevil, displaying a momentary pause in his relentless pursuits, observes the sudden and unexpected turn of events. Despite the fixer's criminal history, a brief flicker of empathy crosses Daredevil's features. With the fixer incapacitated, Daredevil shifts his focus to the arriving police forces who swiftly round up the remaining members of the criminal crew. The terminal once echoing with the chaotic footsteps of pursuit now resonates with the sounds of justice being served. In the aftermath, Daredevil stands amid the subdued atmosphere of the subway terminal, a solitary figure surrounded by reverberance of his actions. The pursuit of the fixer may be over, but the echoes of the night's events linger shaping ongoing journey of the man without fear. Daredevil returns to the civilian life and shows up for work. His co workers worried about his well-being. We just had a call, Mr. Murdoch, an accused murderer named Slade. He wanted to know if, if we defend him, but I turned him down from the police report. I was convinced he's guilty. Hope you don't mind, Matt. Mind? No, I don't mind at all. Not a bit. Not one single bit. Dad, where are you? I kind of hope you're resting easier now. Next issue, Daredevil, Volume 1, Issue 2, The Evil Menace of Electro.